you can see on the first slide here, I just uh, put up some of the basic categories that I tend to cover because these are conditions that tend to co-occur with bipolar disorder. So you've got the anxiety reactions, which can be divided into free floating, which means general anxiety disorder, basically specific stimuli such as phobia and defensive rituals, which basically means obsessive compulsive disorder. And then sometimes people will have psychotic features with bipolar. So that could be hallucinations, delusions, or hearing voices and hearing things. And then we're all familiar with mania and depression, which is down there at the bottom with mood disorders. Now, the thing that most people don't realize about mental illness is that what we go through is not that strange. Uh, Dr. Callinger in his introduction to my book says that every psychiatric diagnosis exists within every person. The major difference has to do with degree. And I have to agree with this and I think it's a very important notion, especially when we're putting together our self-esteem as mental patients. I've got here a pie chart of the states of consciousness some of the states of consciousness that exist. And over on the right side are the ones that people generally think of as sane. And on the left side are some of the ones that people generally think of as insane. Now, you'll notice at the top is standard consciousness that most people spend all their time in and they think that's it. But they don't think about the sleep that they spend almost half their time in. They don't think about unconsciousness, which many, many people go through, or hypnosis, for instance, which is an altered state that is very therapeutic. And of course, lots of people have been intoxicated or high, and I included that state down at the bottom. And so what people tend to do is they divide the right side from the left side and say, well, these are sane and these are insane, and they drop it into these categories. And I've divided them here. You can see the mania and depression at the top are in the mood disorders and the hallucinations in the thought disorders and so forth. And then at the bottom, if there is also substance abuse, you have the dual diagnosis. But what they don't realize is that everybody is capable of every one of these states of consciousness. When people are in a lot of trauma, in a lot of grief, if they have been tortured, there are such things as nervous breakdowns, and the reasons are that under enough pressure, anybody can exhibit any of these symptoms. And so, what I did when I decided, what am I going to call people in this book? I don't want to say mental illness over and over. It's, it's unwieldy, uh, it's not necessarily complimentary, what do I want to call it? What do we have in common? Well, I decided that what we had in common was the ability without drugs, without trauma, to experience these altered states over here on the left that are unusual for other people. And so the acronym I'll be using today is PASC, Prone to Altered States of Consciousness. And I may also use the term special chemistry. I think that's a less judgmental term, and it's a better job of describing what actually happens to us. And you'll note that an altered state isn't necessarily a bad thing. It is just a different thing. So I'll start with strategy one, which hopefully we've all been through, which is admitting your condition. And of course, as we know, the standard medical treatment is either medicine, therapy, or both. Um, both together tend to work best. The problem we have with this is that an idea called compliance, whoops, sorry. I don't like that word compliance because it makes us sound like we're naughty school children who are not behaving. But it's a very important concept. We need to take our medicine it's very common for people to think that they don't need medicine and they're really not sick. And I understand this. I understand it very well. It takes a lot of courage to take the position. The basic human position is I'm right. Everybody else is wrong. 
To admit that you are past is to say, I could be wrong about anything, and I may have to take your word about what reality is. That is an extremely difficult position to take. Let me give you an example. I know a man who was past, and also at about the age of 19 was in a terrible auto accident, and for weeks they were debating whether they could save his leg or not. And while he was in the hospital, he developed a delusion. He believed that outside there was a panel truck waiting for him in the parking lot. And that panel truck was just waiting to kill him. That no matter what they did for his leg, no matter how well they treated him, the minute he came out of the hospital, it was going to zoom up out of the parking lot and smash into him, finally killed him, killing him. And he was as sure about that truck as you are that the sun is rising tomorrow. So they told him, oh, well, that you're paranoid, and they gave him medicine, and towards the end of his stay, he was maybe not entirely sure that the truck was there, but he was pretty convinced. How much courage did it take for him to take everybody else's word that it wasn't there and step out into that parking lot knowing that if they were wrong, he would die a horrible death? Not everybody has that courage, and not everybody has the courage to say, yes, I'm sick, and take medicine. But if your symptoms are pronounced enough for you to be diagnosed, then your symptoms are pronounced enough that you need medicine, and we need to take it. Um, there are some exceptions, as there are to everything. Um, but we may not be the best judge of our condition. That's the thing that's hard to understand. My father found out in his 50s that he was bipolar. Basically, once I was diagnosed, we realized that he had it as well. And under protest, started to take medicine. And he felt that his medicine made no difference. He didn't see any change in his behavior or in his feelings, and so he stopped taking it. He didn't tell anybody that he had stopped taking it. But within a week, his wife said, Jimmy, if you don't start taking your medicine again, I'm going to leave. Because she could tell right away. It was really obvious to her. So we may not be the best judge of whether our behavior has changed and whether the medicine has made a difference. We may have to take other people's word for a while until we get really good at this. Of course, sometimes medicine doesn't work. In that case, the thing to do is not to give up, but to try other medicine. We are fortunate enough that there is a lot of medicine now. Um, plenty of people feel like medicine isn't a very good solution, and to some extent I'd have to agree with them, but I look at it this way. If I were in a dark alley and there were some thugs coming down at me and I was about to have the fight of my life and the only weapon I could find was a sharpened stick, would I throw that stick away because it just wasn't a very good weapon? It wasn't a very good weapon? Or would I use it with everything I had? Medicine is our sharpened stick. It is not the best tool. Someday, hopefully, there will be other tools. But right now, it's what we have, and we need to use it with all the power at our disposal. Now, as I said, there are exceptions, and I want to show you uh, a couple of short examples, because a lot of people think they are the exception. I know a man who was born with cleft palate. He had eight different birth defects in his head, in his ears, nose, and throat. And he also developed mental illness as he got older. When they finally found the, co the cocktail that made him completely sane, he also lost his hearing and his ability to speak. So he takes almost nothing and lives with his symptoms. And under periods of extreme stress, he'll take more of the medicine, enough to make him able to function. Now, that's an exception where somebody is excused from taking pretty much all of their medicine. But you know what? I wouldn't want to be him. 
he has to live with his symptoms all the time. Now I know another woman whose medicine took away her ability to imagine things and create things, and she is a painter. So obviously that didn't work for her. She couldn't live like that. Is she excused from taking her medicine? No. She needs to find another medicine, and that means she should decrease slowly on her doctor's orders and find the new one at the doctor's advice. Not that she should just stop because she doesn't like it and it bothers her. Now here's another example. I need antipsychotics. I have psychotic features. And when I first started taking antipsychotics, I found I couldn't write poetry anymore. I went through about a 10 year period where I really couldn't write poetry because I went into an altered state to write poetry. And that altered state wasn't easily available to me anymore. Did that mean I was excused from taking antipsychotics? Well, no. I needed them, and I write poetry for my own pleasure. It wasn't my job. It was just for fun. So, I learned to write around my antipsychotic. I learned a new way to write poetry, but I kept taking medicine. So, if you're wondering if you're an exception, perhaps those Three examples will give you an idea. Now, a word about mania because mania is a little special. People don't like to take medicine for it because it feels wonderful. And I understand that. I absolutely do. You feel brilliant and witty and you have more ideas than God and that's wonderful. Who wouldn't want that for free if they could get it? This is what all the drugs are designed to give you and often don't. But I've learned to hate what it costs me. I'm just going to be the wet blanket and ask, what about afterwards? Who is going to pay the hospital bill? Who is going to pay the $30,000 in credit card, bill, credit card bills? Who's going to pay for the ticket back home from Russia where yesterday you thought it was such a good idea to fly? How are you going to explain to your partner that it was really only logical and fair that you sleep with his best friend? How are you going to explain to your next interviewer why you said what you said to your last boss in front of the entire staff? And how many times do you clean up these messes before you get tired of it? We need to take our medicine. We need to avoid mania. If nothing else, here's another question. Why would we want to do that to our friends? Why would we want to be that kind of a jerk? I spent all of my 20s with lots and lots of mania. I have no friends left from my 20s. And that's what can happen. So it's very important that even though mania feels wonderful, we try to avoid it. You know, substance use, that's another problem. I realize I'm spending a lot of time on these, but they are basic issues that everybody has to face. I understand why people love the substance abuse. It's called self-medicating. It's extremely common, but it's a good way to cause yourself nothing but trouble. Our medicines are designed to nudge the electrochemical reactions, which are very delicate in our brains, and normalize them. If we use drugs or drink more than just occasionally, we're adding random chemicals to the soup. Whatever will happen next is not normalcy and we're making toxic waste dumps out of our bodies. We have trouble in the first place because our brains flip off into altered states without our permission. We shuffle to and from several different realities and that's why it's so hard to function in the world. When we use, we're adding more altered states layer on layer and we're spinning further and further away from the world that most people live in. So we need to limit or manage our altered states, not multiply them with the use of substances. Okay, enough time on that. Now, the next thing that usually happens, or very often anyway, is that we need help from various bureaucracies and agencies because quite often we're not able to work anymore or we're not able to work full time. And it is sometimes very hard to get results. So I thought I'd share some of my tips with you for getting the best results from the system. 
And the first tip is not to expect fast results. You need to have a plan B. If you need housing next week, start counting up friends' sofa beds right now. Uh, expect that big benefits like disability will take maybe up to two or four years to achieve. Small ones like assistance paying for your pet's vaccinations might take about six weeks. Government-sponsored benefits are always harder to get because there are more hoops to jump through. They are trying to safeguard the taxpayer's money. So have a plan B. Uh, the second is don't miss deadlines or appointments. Even if you're sick or you need an attendant, find a way to manage it or reschedule it. And reschedule it ahead of time. Do not tell them after. If you miss, you can mess up the whole system, the whole program they have of how it works, and they can deny your application on the grounds that you didn't do your part. So it's important to follow their schedule. If you can't make it, you must reschedule. Or bring someone with you who is very organized and can explain to them what it is that you need. Third thing, get everything in writing and keep the paperwork. If it's an interview or a phone call, be sure to write down any instructions or any promises they make along with the date and who told you. Keep names and phone numbers that are helpful. Um, if you, uh, how do I put this? The general numbers that you will find in the phone book and online are just that general. They have the low level functionaries doing the work, the people that know the least, and they are not going to be the most helpful. An inside number to a specific person is worth five outside numbers. So if you get transferred to someone who can handle your problem better, be sure to ask for the number, say, in case I get cut off, what is this number? And be sure to ask for the name of the person you're going to be talking to and write it down. The next time you call about that problem, ask for that person, and you won't have to explain all over again and backtrack. And then when you finish whatever your business is with this person, ask them, okay, so where should I go next? And maybe you'll get another inside number. Uh, okay, another point is to copy what you send. It can happen. It has happened. It's a savvy trick to send things by certified or registered mail so you can prove an office got something on such and such a date. It can happen that they completely lose the information you spent six weeks gathering. And if you have no copies, then you're out of luck and you have to start all over again. It, it does happen and it's always a good idea if you have a copy of what you sent to refer to. So when they refer to such and such and say, when you said so and so, what did you mean? You can look right at it and you can tell them immediately. Go in person to the offices if you can. I know in the age of internet, this is not something a lot of people do. And of course, if you're not in the same city, you can't do that. But if you want a service and you can get to the office, get presentable and go there. A friend of mine needed housing and we went together to the county office. We received a 25 page handout of places to look and agencies to contact. Nobody's going to give you that over the phone, and it may or may not be online. You have to be there. And also, the human touch works wonders. It is a lot easier to refuse someone on the phone or be stonewalled online than it is to say no to a person who is standing right there looking at you, hopefully, and asking you questions. So if you can, that's the smart way to go. Um, be short and polite. That's kind of self-explanatory, but I think you need to know that losing your temper will really just probably get you thrown out the door with these people or hung up on or given really bad service. Um, these are functionaries. They're not social workers. They're not caseworkers. They haven't been trained to take care of you. They just want to get the paperwork done and continue with the process. That's all they're interested in. So it has to be 
kind of inefficient ease and just kind of business as usual. Uh, there's no point in trying to get them involved and in trying to get them to feel your pain or to be interested in your story. They see too many people all day long and they just, most of them, you will find exceptions, but most of them are not interested and it won't help your case. Have plenty of proof. That's kind of obvious. Everything you think they might question, be sure and have proof. Back up your diagnosis, your work history, your hospitalizations, uh, get paperwork from doctors and employers or their agreement to back you up if someone calls them, have a lease to prove your residence or a friend who will verify that you are staying with them. In bureaucracies, paperwork is gone. You cannot afford to be disorganized about this. And then a rather obvious one, which is don't show up symptomatic. If you are having symptoms and you're maybe not in very much touch with reality, you can't be dealing with these people. This is a time to either bring someone with you who can explain or call up and reschedule because it's not a good time for you to be in those offices. Um, there are a lot of, a lot more tips I have put an address down there that you can go to to get a free download. It's, it's on my website and it's, um, it's called Surfing the System, just like this portion of the lecture. So I hope everybody has had a chance to copy that because I'm going to go on. One of the next things that happens is that some of us think we'll never have a relationship again. Maybe we lose our relationship when we get a diagnosis and we think nobody's going to want us. But that is not true. Um, what we need to realize is that every relationship is based on some basic agreements. They may not be spoken, but there are agreements between any couple. The agreement might be, I'll work and you'll go to school, or uh, I'll work and you'll take care of the children. There are all kinds of agreements in the world, some of them not very healthy. The agreement may be, I'll sleep with whomever I want and you will be faithful to me all kinds of agreements. If your basic agreement with your partner before the diagnosis was, we'll be healthy and have fun together, and then you develop a chronic illness, then the chance is that they may say, no, you know what, I didn't sign up for this, and they'll leave. However, you can find a mature partner who is able to stay around with somebody who has a chronic illness, somebody who thinks you who are worthwhile and they can handle the inconveniences. So that's what you need to look for, somebody with some maturity, somebody with some staying power, and you can find those people. The world is full of millions of people with all kinds of needs, every kind of need, and there is somebody out there who needs exactly what you have to offer. Keep up the work on your sanity. Um, you may not be able, you know, we can't always control all of our symptoms, but if we are doing everything we can and our partner knows we are doing everything we can, they are more likely to stay around than if we are saying, well, I don't feel like taking my medicine today, and, and then we blow up and then they suffer. Uh, we should try to shield our partner from the worst of our most extreme states, obviously, if you're starting to lose it and you can leave the room, that's a good thing to do. If you're starting to lose it and you can take more medicine and control that and uh, you know, maybe fake a little bit with your partner that you're a little more calm than you actually are, that's a good thing to do. Um, just because sometimes we're going through hell doesn't mean that we should let our partner go through hell if we can control it. I understand sometimes we can't control it. Be the best partner you can. That's kind of obvious, but think about it. If you are wonderful to be with all the time, except when you're having symptoms, you are way ahead of the partner who doesn't care and never treats their partner right, even though they're perfectly healthy. And lastly, you want to know your value. People who are past are special in a lot of ways. One of them is that they have depth. They have courage. Many of them to survive have developed a lot of humor. They have all kinds of qualities. And these qualities are worthwhile and a mature developed person 
is very liable to want those qualities. So don't think of yourself as someone damaged that no one would want. You are special, and I don't mean special just as in disabled. I mean special as in well-developed, and that's worth someone being with. Now I'm going to the, what I call the core techniques. The most important thing that you can do for yourself is learn to identify your altered states. Learn to know when you are not in standard reality. The person who knows they're not in standard reality is a hundred miles ahead of the one that thinks everything is normal and is upsetting everyone around them. And the way you can do this is take inventory of yourself. I am a rapid cycler, so I do it nightly. If you have a longer schedule, then maybe you would do it weekly. So basically, at the end of the day, I look back on the day and I say to myself, and you might not want to put it to yourself this way, I say, how sane was I today? You might want to say, how even-tempered was I today? How easy was I to live with? However you'd like to put it to yourself and start looking at how you act and where the extremes were and start remembering how that felt. How did the extreme felt? Compare that to the time when you felt even tempered and ordinary. How are they different? How did your stomach feel? How did your neck feel? How did your head feel? What was going on with you? What did it feel like? So you can recognize that next time it comes around. And this is a long-term technique. So when you've been doing this a while, you ask yourself, all right, between the last time I felt okay and the time I went to my extreme, what happened? And over time, you will notice that there are things that happen over and over again that tend to trigger you. They can be different for everybody. But a standard example that they used to give us in rehab was what they called HALT. They said, don't get too hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Those can all be things that can tend to set us off because they make us weaker. Uh, I find that things like too much rushing, too much noise, too much light even. I'm very sensitive to light. And if it's a very bright day, I can get very sick. It gets into my head and it does funny things to me. Your triggers will be different. We're all different. But if you learn to recognize those triggers, you can start learning to avoid them. And you can have fewer episodes. As you get good at this, you can learn to recognize your states as they begin to happen instead of much later when you're way at the top or way at the bottom. You can start to learn your early warning behaviors. I know that for me, for instance, mania starts, mania ends as an irrational age, irrational rage. And it starts as a certain level of irritability at everything around me. My mania is anger and it starts with irritability and frustration and starting to snap at everybody around me, even though there's not really a reason and they're not really doing anything to antagonize me. Those are my early warnings. You have early warning behaviors and you can learn to recognize them and say, okay, things are going south here. I need to do something. And in the end, you can learn to practice prevention. As I mentioned, you can have avoidance skills. You might want to, you know, go in your room and close the door. Um, the things will be different for everybody. I will take myself away from lots of stimulus because for me, lots of stimulus is not very good. Too much noise, too many people, too much rushing around, too much light. Those all set me off so I can go away from those, for example. And you will learn coping skills over time. Maybe you need to take a bath or take a walk or pet your pet. There are things that you will learn over time that help lead you to help that you can do if you know that something is coming on. But you need to be patient. This is a long-term technique. You need to check in with yourself over and over again. Monitor yourself and say, okay, how am I doing right now? 
How was I doing today? How do these states differ? What do they feel like? How can I recognize them? Mood disorders in general, there are some things we need to understand uh, to hopefully handle some of the extreme emotions. And the first thing is to recognize that emotions are chemicals. We like to think of them as some sort of internal prompting about the truths of our lives, some sort of recognition about what's really important, some sort of reaction to what's going on. If we have a mood disorder, it's not always a reaction to what's going on. It can be a chemical surge. And we may not ever know what caused it. It may have nothing to do with what's going on. And if you get that at a basic level, at a gut level, you understand that you may not be able to trust your emotions. And if you get a huge wave of emotion coming over you, you should be suspicious. Then you can start to learn to deal with them to some degree. One way is by understanding the limbic system, where most of our emotions live. It's a, a small part of the brain in the brain stem, a couple of little organs that are uh, all kind of tied together in a small system. The limbic system, for instance, uh, controls fear and rage. The thing to know about the limbic system is that it doesn't mature after you're about two years old. So the rage and the fear and the sadness, the basic impulses that you feel when you're 42 are the same as the ones you felt when you were two. That's why they're so strong. That's why they are so hard to control. We do learn some control over the years, but the basic feelings are the same. And what we need to know is that when something like that is triggered, the chemicals flood our body and they're in our bloodstream and they make us feel that way only for 90 seconds. At the end of 90 seconds, if we don't buy into it, if we don't hook into it and start playing with it and, and building on it, it flushes away and we're free again. 90 seconds is a long time to wait when you're angry. But if you can learn to practice a delayed reaction and let it flow over you like a wave and just feel it, it's okay to feel it, just don't do anything, then you might be able to make a choice about what you're going to do next instead of reacting in a knee-jerk way. This, again, takes a lot of practice and it, it's not 100%. You're not always going to have all of this work for you. These are just things that help, that make symptoms uh, less common and less extreme and less troublesome. Now, the problem with all these huge emotions is we're going to have them anyway. And they are energy. Emotions are energy. Energy needs to be dispersed. If we can't use it yelling at somebody or crying our eyes out, what are we going to do with it? We need to learn to disperse the energy. I think this is one of the reasons why it's always uh, recommended for us to get a lot of exercise. Because exercise helps get rid of that energy. There are other things that psychologists recommend that also help with this. Things like screaming into your pillow or beating things with your pillow. Or uh, you can take a hammer and pound in a bunch of nails. What I do is I go to my husband's drum set and I just get the hell out of that thing. I scream and I yell and I hit the drums and after about five minutes, I feel immeasurably better. And I don't even have to be actively upset to do this. It's just that I know the emotions are building up and I'm hopefully not reacting to them. So at some point they have to be dispersed. So I do this regularly. Uh, and the thing to remember, you know, we might feel strange not reacting to our anger or not reacting to our fear or not reacting to our, our, um, our great excitement that makes us want to rush off and do something impractical. But the fact is, it's just a delay. If you find out that your emotion was actually totally made sense and you still want to react to it, you still can. You can return to that issue when you're calm and do whatever you want about it. 
you can say to your husband or whoever, I can't talk about this right now and leave the room. And later you can come back and say, okay, I really need to discuss this with you. When such and such happened, it was not okay with me. You can go back and do that when you're calm and get a much better result than if you fly off the handle when you're feeling a huge wave of emotion. So that's what I do. And I offer these techniques for what they're worth, and I hope they help. Now, psychosis. It may be that most of you here today don't have to deal with psychosis, but some of us do. And some of the techniques for dealing with that are the same, such as learning the early warning signs. Uh, there are preparations that we can make. We can carry a medical alert card. I've got a little business card with a big red stripe across the top so it stands out in my wallet. And if I were to show up somewhere and couldn't take care of myself and couldn't talk to anybody, I would tell them what drugs I take, what the milligrams are, how many times a day, and the name and number of my doctor. So if somebody's going through my wallet trying to identify me and figure out what to do with me, they will find that and they can help me take care of myself. Also, I recommend carrying two-day supply of medication with you everywhere you go for the rest of your life. I really do. Things go wrong. And if you are a person who needs antipsychotics, when the time comes that you need them, you need them now. You don't need them when you get home. You need them now. Uh, things happen. You know, there could be an accident, a, a, a ride could not show up, and you're stuck somewhere. How are you going to get through the next day? Do you want to be completely out of sync by the time you get home? No. So carry a little, small, you can stick in your wallet, you can stick it in your pocket, it can be a little teeny pillbox, but it can have just enough to get you through one more day. I also recommend having an emergency number on speed dial. My experience is, if you start to go into psychosis, you are not going to be able to remember phone numbers. But you might be able to remember, there's help if I hit one, if I hit the number one. So that can be a great help. And then, when you find there's no way to avoid it, it's coming on, you're taking your medicine, then find a safe spot. If you feel yourself losing it, reach for your antipsychotics, and the next thing, if you can't get home fast, find somewhere safe. Somewhere safe means somewhere where nobody will bother you for a while and you won't be bothering them. So just a corner somewhere. And what do you do after that? You do nothing. I'm very serious. No matter what you feel, what you hear, or what you see, don't do anything and don't say anything. You can't hurt anybody by being silent. This may sound like odd advice, but it comes from decades of experience. If we start acting on anything at all when we are psychotic, there's no telling where it will lead. We're not in control, and the only safe thing to do is nothing. So train yourself to be still and quiet, like a little animal hiding in the woods when a predator passes by. Uh, even if you're not worried about police reaction outdoors, for instance, think about the human relations aspect of it. We can't say the one unforgivable thing if we don't talk. We can't alienate our friends by just sitting still. We can't throw our fist through a wall if we're not moving. We just take our pill and then we wait for it to kick in. Wait for it to pass. These attacks do not last forever. Nothing lasts forever. And when it's over, you won't be in trouble. You won't have a huge mess to clean up because you didn't do anything. Again, I'm not saying everybody can do these anytime. I am saying these are things to shoot for, and they work. Suicidal depression. Okay, I've gone a little long now, and I need to go over these fairly quickly. Um, the way I look at depression, and we've all got a little hope motor that helps us get up in the morning and face the next day. 
when you are suicidal, the hope motor is broken. And what you need to do is not buy into that. No matter how you feel, remind yourself, my brain is lying to me. And your only job when you're suicidal is to stay alive until that motor starts again. Hopefully medicine will start it, otherwise time will start it. Luckily, we are bipolar, and therefore eventually that depression will end and we'll go to the other end of the scale. And thank God for that. I, you know, not thank God for mania, but thank God that we don't stay in that depression for the rest of our life. Uh, when you are depressed, when you are suicidal, don't skimp on the medication, don't skip on the therapy, no matter how much you feel like it's not helping. Get a crisis number, use it, don't be afraid to use it as many times as you need to at any hour of the day or night. Get rid of weapons. If you find yourself thinking of overdosing, your pills can be weapons, you need to get rid of them. You need to find someone who will pass that dose out to you on a daily basis if they have to. I guarantee you, your friends would rather come over and give you your pills than have you die. No matter how inconvenient it is to them, they'd rather that. Don't be afraid to go to the hospital. Don't think about what it's going to cost or whether it will be embarrassing or what will happen to your job. You need to stay alive. And if that means going to the hospital, then do it. And then um, there's what I call the core distracting activity. What I'm talking about, I spent two years in bed one time because uh, I wanted to die. And all I could think about was how much I wanted to die. And this is how I survived. I found something passive to keep myself occupied. It could be TV or books or audio tapes or crosswords. Anything will do if it keeps you from sitting around thinking about how much you want to die. Cuddling your cat or stuffed animals. If you just sit and think, you might destroy yourself. If you have to watch reruns at 3 in the morning, then do that. That's better than dying. Uh, this is a good time to listen to music. This is a good time to take up knitting. I mean, you could play Slinky or Solitaire or Marbles or surf endlessly on your computer. You want to go into a mindless zone where you are just too slightly busy to think about how much you hurt. That's what you want from the distracting activity. It probably won't be wildly pleasurable because nothing is at this time, but if it's enough that you'll do it probably every day because it's a little bit pleasant, then that's good enough. You want to avoid major life decisions? When your motor is broken, your view of life, my view of life, our view of life, is so black. I mean, life just looks like the bottom of an ashtray or the bottom of a kitty litter box. Everything looks bad. And whatever decisions you make will be affected by that viewpoint, and they will be wrong. They will not fit any other time in your life. Don't get married. Don't get divorced. Don't get a job unless you absolutely have to because you have to eat. Um, and don't quit a job. These are not the times to do that. And then we have what I call the rote routine. This is a preparation. Uh, you have to prepare for this ahead of time. Figure out what the three to five most important things are that you have to do every day. Do them every day as soon as you get up. And then when you are depressed, if you get out of bed at all, you will automatically do those three to five things. And um, then the most important stuff will be done. Otherwise, you might just stay in bed and that's it. And when you get up, you might just bop around and then nothing ever gets done. But if you are used to doing the most important things, then that will tend to continue. Before you get depressed, you want to learn, uh, you want to try to automate and delegate what you can, automatic bill pay, have people set up ahead of time that you can call them and say, all right, I'm really not okay, I need someone to fetch the groceries. I'm really not okay, I need someone to feed the cats for me for a while. Have this set up ahead of time. Try to eat one decent meal. It very often happens that people either stop eating or they eat way too much of a lot of junk and then when they feel like themselves again, they've gained 40 pounds. 
this, this is not fun. Um, try to eat one meal that's good for you, even though you don't care. And the final argument for staying alive during a suicidal depression is that everything changes. I'll tell you what I mean. When I had this two-year in-bed episode, not only was I very depressed, but my life looked very bad. Uh, I didn't have a job. I didn't really have any skills anymore. I was unable to go back to school to get skills. I was estranged from my family. I had almost no friends. I had no relationship. And I was losing my health. I really didn't see a future. I didn't see how there was ever going to be a future. And here I was only 29. Now, today, I have a beautiful home. I have, believe it or not, two cars. I've published three books. I have a wonderful husband that I love very much, and for some odd reason, he's happy with me. I have a beautiful life. There was no way to tell that I was going to get from there to here. What if I had missed all this? What if I gave up too soon and missed all of this? The fact is that life changes. No matter what your circumstances are, they will not stay that way. Even if you are in perfect circumstances and you had a million dollars and you were willing to pay to keep your life exactly that way for 30 years, you couldn't do it. It's not possible. Life doesn't work that way. So whatever your life is, whatever your circumstances is, they will change. And you will not always be feeling this way. Your depression will lift and life will change. Lastly, quite apart from symptoms, quite apart from medicines and all the things that we use, we need a purpose. We need something that we're doing with our life. And granted, we may not be able to do what we originally had planned to do with our life, but we have been given a gift in many ways. If we can't work anymore, or we can't work full time, we're out of the rat race. We don't have to be the CEO of a company. We don't have to have a Lexus. We don't have to impress anybody anymore. We're out of that cycle. We can choose to find what's best for us. What fulfills you? What makes you happy? If we're not working 40 hours a week, we have the gift of time. And time is the most valuable thing of all. You can't buy it. There's no way to barter for it. And when you've lost your time, that's it. There are people who would give anything to have just one more year of life or just one more day with their loved one, but the time is up. We have time. We can use that time to be the kind of person we want to be, to do what matters to us, to fulfill ourselves in any little way. It doesn't have to be a big way. Just give yourself a purpose because sitting around taking pills is not a life. Sitting around avoiding symptoms is not a life. We are here for some reason and we can find that reason and enjoy ourselves and be ourselves. So that's my, uh, that's my spiel. There's the name of my book at the top if you'd like to look it up and find out more about it. There's a lot more in the book that I wasn't able to get to today. And there's the website and the, uh, the little publishing company that I own with my husband. And I hope that that's been useful. And now I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Deborah. That was wonderful and very uh, educational. We really appreciate it. So we are now going to be taking questions from everyone. Um, our first question is, you said there is always a huge focus on how to prevent and handle the manic part, but nothing on how to handle the depression. Could you please elaborate on that? Uh, I don't think I said exactly that. I did say that it's harder to be willing to avoid the mania because mania feels good. Um, I think people are kind of at a loss when it comes to what to do about depression. They'll tell you things like keep busy, go here, go there, uh, you know, get up and shower, 
but they really don't know what to do if you're actively suicidal. They don't know what to say or how they can help you. So I was trying to address that. Thank you. Just waiting for some more questions to come through. What does PASC stand for? Okay, that was my um, acronym for the condition that we all have. I get tired of mental illness and other uh, things that seem to judge us in the way they're put. So I came up with prone to altered states of consciousness, P-A-S-C, PASC. It's, I, I, I made it up. I, I wanted something that I could use that was not a hefty phrase like mental illness. And I also sometimes say special chemistry as well. Thank you for clarifying. Our next question is, do you have tips for dealing with stress between family members when they're shell-shocked and even normal behaviors are seen as symptoms? Ah, uh, you know, that is difficult. I have not lived with my family for a very long time. Um, I think one thing that you need to keep reminding people of is that they are dealing with symptoms, not your personality. That's something that they need to know, that, that you will return and be yourself at a certain point if they will be patient. Um, and if you know anything they can do that would help you, it's really good to bring that up. They feel better if there's something that they can do. Otherwise, as far as being seen as not being exactly rational when in fact you are, unfortunately, I don't know how to do that except to continue to be rational and to show them that you are not scary. Uh, explain things to them as rationally as you can and show them that you do understand what's going on. It takes a lot of education. Thank you. Will they always hospitalize a person if they are psychotic? No, no, not always. Um, I think it depends on degree. I've gone through psychotic episodes where I was not hospitalized, uh, basically because I was safe for other people and for myself. That is the standard these days. In fact, it's harder to get into the hospital and it's harder to stay in than it is to stay out. Because people these days are very concerned about how they're going to get paid. Um, they, are they are worried about your insurance and the laws are so strict that you must be a danger to yourself or to others before they will admit you. That is usually the case. Right. How do you deal with a family member who doesn't recognize his or her psychosis or altered state? That's very difficult. Um, and sometimes it can't be solved. I will mention something that I didn't have a slide about. People are beginning to recognize that there is a condition called anosognosia. And, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, double jointed term, I don't like to use terms like that, but basically sometimes, um, particularly in bipolar and schizophrenic states, people's brain can be altered such that they are unable to recognize that they are sick. This happens sometimes with stroke victims. Their entire left side may be paralyzed and they'll tell you that nothing's wrong. They simply cannot see that they are ill. Um, I would, I would say, get online, look up anosognosia, I'll, I'll spell it for you, and see what's recommended. Because this is a fairly new field. Anosognosia is A-N-O-S-O-G-N-O-S-I-A. And it basically means not knowing you're sick. I know there is at least one website that deals with uh, anosognosia in mental illness. And they go into some detail and there are videos on the site and so forth. Thank you. 
My partner wants to talk about what is going on with me when I need quiet time. How do I get him to understand without setting him off? Mm. You might have to just really insist. Uh, I had trouble with this with my partner as well. And eventually what happened was he found that if he did not leave me alone, I would explode at him and there would be a terrible scene. So he learned when I say, I need to be alone, I need to stop talking about this right now, he learned from experience that I meant it and he'd better listen. Um, that may be what's necessary, but don't be afraid to be rude. Don't be afraid to say, I'm not talking about this anymore. I'm leaving, I'm getting out of this room and you leave me alone. Do what you have to do and see if that will make a difference because people are sometimes afraid to be impolite. If you have to be impolite, be impolite, but take care of yourself. When it is, when is it appropriate to let someone know that you are bipolar? Now that's very much a judgment call. I tend to tell people um, anytime it seems like it might be coming up at the conversation, anytime I see that it's relevant, um, mostly when they know me well enough to not be scared of me. Because I feel like it's my job to be an ambassador and show people that having special chemistry doesn't mean you're dangerous and scary. So I'll wait till they know me a little bit, they're comfortable, um, they've dealt with me enough to be comfortable, and then when it's relevant to the conversation, I'll bring it up. And I just bring it up as a medical condition. It's uh, no more scary than if I had diabetes or a heart condition. I bring it up very matter-of-factly. Everybody does it a little differently and you have to kind of develop your own technique. It's very much a judgment call when to tell people and who to tell. Thank you for that. So kind of piggybacking off of the previous question, how would you handle a spouse that just doesn't understand your illness? Hmm. I would probably see if I could get them to a, a NAMI meeting or get them into the classes, the family to family classes. I don't know if everybody has heard of NAMI, but they're the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And they have free classes for the families of people that have special chemistry. Um, they, they usually happen at night, you know, on, on weekends and so forth when people could make them. And they'll educate anybody who wants to know about really what it means to have a family member with a special chemistry condition. They do a lot of good for a lot of people and it's a free resource so that would probably be my first stop. Um, if they're not willing to do that, maybe give them a book to read, get them to talk to your doctor. Uh, they need to be educated and we also need to remember that there is no way for them to really understand. They haven't been there. They haven't felt it. I had a brother that I loved very much, and I explained to him all about exactly how it was. And he said he understood, and he thought he understood. And then later, when he was sick, he went over an episode of dementia, and he came to me and said, now I understand. I thought I understood, but I really didn't understand at all. I didn't know what it's like when your brain doesn't work. So we need to keep in mind that on a certain level, they will never really understand and that's not their fault. Thank you. How did you get back the ability to write poetry after the medication suppressed it? Well, I started looking for ways to get back into a similar altered state that I used to um, fall into naturally. So I would look at candles or into fires. I would take long walks. I would listen to water flowing, you know, things that might put me in that state of mind. And I began to practice as much as I could writing poetry in a more conscious way. Uh, it was never again as easy as it used to be. It didn't come as intuitively and naturally as it used to. But I learned to do it more consciously in a, a craftsman-like way. And uh, while my poetry is not exactly the same, I would say in some ways it's better than it used to be. So uh, I just had to work at it more. 
Do you feel that just sitting with your symptoms can lead to further decompensation in a crisis situation? It can. It can. Sometimes for me, just sitting with my symptoms very quietly uh, leads to things dying down. At other times, it can lead to me just uh, getting all caught up in it and caught up in a, in a whirl, whirlwind of those symptoms and getting worse and worse. I don't think there's really a way to tell um, which time that's going to be. It's a matter of experimentation, I'm afraid. I wish we had more answers. Thank you. Our next question is, there is both bipolar and unipolar in our family. I have a moody teenager who does not want to be labeled or think she has an illness. How do I tell the difference between typical teenage behavior and bipolar behavior? Hmm. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. I will say that I was bipolar as a teen um, and nobody caught it. Um, they did suspect that maybe there was something wrong with me, but nobody really knew. Um, I would say, depending on how long it goes on, depending on how extreme it is, depending on how irrational it is. If it's just overreaction to everything, it might just be being a teen. But if there seem to be these huge reactions when nothing much is going on, uh, then I would be suspicious. How would you rec how how would you recommend we share our stories with community organizers or community organizations? Well, again, I'm going to refer to NAMI here because that's what I know. They have a program called In Our Own Voice that I lecture for, and you've got an organiz an organizer who finds community organizations that are willing to learn and you come and make a presentation. There's a video and two people that tell a little of their story after each portion of the video. That kind of thing is great because when you go there, they're already open to listening. They already want to know. And the people that go are trained. So I would say if you're gonna share on your own, um, go over it a few times so that you feel really comfortable sharing without getting upset. Um, and keep making a fairly smooth narrative on it, just hitting the high points, not going into great, long, sad detail, because people just need summaries, really. Um, other than that, I'm not sure what to tell you because I haven't done that outside of the In Our Own Voice program. Thank you, and we have time. I'm sorry for one last question. How can you get a teenager with bipolar and op oppositional defiance and traumatic brain injury to cooperate about his recovery. Oh my goodness, I'm not sure that you can. Um, it's very difficult when someone is a teen because they haven't had the opportunity um, to really see the long-term results of their behavior. Uh, I myself finally figured out that there was something wrong with me when I was 26 and I had been ill since I was 13. So that's 13 years of making a mess of my life and thinking that that was normal. I do not have an answer for you, I'm sorry. Um, you might try comparing them to their peers, not to other patients and not to other people you know or people in books, comparing them to their peers and saying, well, you know, so-and-so acts like this, and when such-and-such such happens to them, they do this, but when that happens to you, you do that. Try, if possible, to get them to see how they behave compared to their peers, because at that age, only their peers matter to them. That's really the only advice I have at that point. I've never been a parent, so you have to understand my ideas on this are limited. I'm just looking at my own teens and thinking what would have made a difference. Thank you, and we appreciate you trying to answer all these questions. Um, we really appreciate you coming and joining us today on our webinar, and thank you everyone who has participated. We really appreciate all your support. 
And thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.